Hi there, this is Jessica Walliser, Editorial Director for Cool Springs Press, and I'm here with another one of our author chats. And I'm about to be joined with Angelo uh, Ferraro Fanning from Accent Root. Fantastic book, The Sustainable Homestead. Uh, we're going to dig a little bit into where she farms and gardens and then talk a little bit more about the book so thank you so much for joining me Angela how are you I'm good how are you good thank you so I I can't believe it I know what a busy time of year it is for gardeners and homesteaders and here you are inside yeah. doing this with me so I'm I'm super appreciative um, having lived a life similar to yours minus all of the animals I know what a time of year this oh. is for chores <laughs> Here's mine. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, I'd like to start the conversation today by having you tell um, the viewers a little bit about your homestead, sort of how you came to be in this space, and what type of conditions and climate you grow yeah. in. Sure. So I'm located on a small homestead in central New Jersey. It originated in 1775, um, but it's been under my ownership for uh, somewhere between eight and 10 years. I was not raised uh, on a farm. I did not come from a farming background in any capacity. Um, it wasn't until I decided to close my graphic and website design business and, you know, ask myself what I really wanted to do and what made me happy, which was to be outside and grow my own food and, and sort of teach my children to live in a lifestyle in alignment with nature. That's when I kind of found my path into homesteading. And I just started to learn and research and absorb as much as I could with regards to growing food. And at the time, I was on a small three quarter acre plot. And so it was very much learning how to replace ornamental plants with edible plants and growing upwards instead of outwards. And long story short, fast forward, I now have a much larger property with Clydesdale horses. Um, I feed bees, we have ducks and geese and sheep, and I'm a permaculture farmer, which means everything comes together. I have a farm ecosystem and everybody contributes in all different ways to the greater whole. And we're going to talk a lot more about that exactly as this conversation proceeds. But um, so how many acres do you have now? So currently I'm on six acres. Six acres. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so you are in like what, what growing zone are you in? So I we used to be considered the border of six B and seven, okay. and now six with seven. Okay, so your book, Sustainable Homestead, mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, I know it includes a lot about your, your personal journey sure. and then teaches others how to sort of the, the steps to consider as they move along on this journey as well. But it's, if, let's say we have a dreamer out there right now watching this and they're dreaming of having a life like this, um, what are some first steps that they can they can start with? Sure. Well, I think and and I think I was guilty of this myself to an extent before I was at the property I am now. I think we think that we have to wait to have a particular size property or plot of land. We can't consider ourselves homesteaders until we have this type of animal or this many num you know this number of animals and we need to have expansive crops that grow from one end of the horizon to the other in rows. But actually, homesteading is just more of a mindset. And so my advice is to start wherever you at, you're at right now. So that could be growing in containers on an apartment balcony. It could be supporting community-supported agricultural programs and having a CSA membership or going to a farmer's market um, and really starting to adapt to a seasonal living mindset. When we do that, we are buying produce that tends to be picked at the ideal time rather than sit on a truck before it's fully ripe and shipped we are going to eat locally or from our backyard and, and when we harvest at the time that the plant is designated or supposed to be you know harvested we are getting more nutritionally dense food and what that does for us is it's richer in nutrients for our bodies and so we get more benefit from that and so there's so many health things that come along with whether or not you're growing the food or produce right in your backyard, just living in alignment with local and seasons is so good um, in all, all different capacities, transportation, packaging reduction, um, it's more environmentally friendly, reduces the carbon footprint, and then also it's just better for your body. So essentially it's any small step. Yeah. 
any small step is what you take to get started in this. I mean, you're absolutely right that people feel like they have to go all in um, in order to be successful at this or even call themselves a homesteader. But maybe it's going to the farmer's market and buying strawberries from a local farmer and making your own preserves that way. And I'd love it's accessible, right? It's it's accessible, which is fantastic. I think that we kind of have gotten you know, in the mindset somehow that acquiring these skills that at one point were passed down from generation to generation, that now to learn that is very foreign to us. We have to find somebody or find a way to learn, find someone who can teach us. And it feels like uh, sort of an initiative has to be taken in order to go gain some of these skills that once were just commonplace. You know, everybody learned how to preserve strawberries from their grandmother or their neighbor or friend. So the point being that like these things are meant to be part of, I think, our human daily, daily, monthly, seasonal routines. They are accessible for everyone. It doesn't matter the size of your kitchen or the size of your plot, the garden, your farm, et cetera. So can this same then apply to the practice of permaculture? Yes. Because actually, maybe we should rewind a little bit. How about we talk about what permaculture is? And I, I know in the book you actually have sort of this, this sidebar here that talks about the 12 yeah. principles of permaculture. Yeah. So let's start there first. We'll start at the very beginning. What is it? What are some of the principles that you have to follow or aim to follow? Yeah, so permaculture is not something I founded by any means. Um, it is, it's, it's a practice which stands for permanent agriculture. And um, there are several sort of founders of the movement who uh, traveled the world and just kind of studied different cultures and how they were growing things in a way that was sort of giving more back to the earth than what was being taken. And so not just in terms of harvest, but also like energy. And so these principles were developed to sort of say, hey, okay, absolutely. It's doesn't matter what growing zone you're in, what terrain you're in, what climate you're located in, you can apply these principles to your own site, your own location, just adapt the approach that you make based on these different initiatives. And so one, for example, would be to capture and store energy. So we're looking at things like, how can we make um, traveling from point A to point B on my part, less energy that I expend, rather than walk all the way to the opposite side of the farm, to the garden, to harvest, to maintain it. Maybe if I put it closer to the house, that makes more sense, right? But then there's also other things like catching and storing water, um, using rain barrels, thinking about water storage systems. Even people are doing amazing things out there um, with dehydrators that are solar operated. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to um, capture and store energy. And then, of course, there's other things just well, like sharing your surplus, um, you know, trying to find ways that work with nature that already surrounds you rather than against it. So we're observing, we're interacting based on what's already there without taking away from the natural ecosystem. So the, the 12 principles of permaculture are widely published. There are books and books and resources out there for anyone that's interested. And so you, how did you come to adopt this practice on your own homestead? I mean, was it from the get-go or was it something that sort of came to be as you started to add animals and maybe start to get your legs under you a bit? How did that happen? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I've always been very eco-minded. I mentioned the graphic design business that I had. It was an eco-friendly design business. I had self-published a book on eco-friendly graphic design and I practiced it regularly in my daily life. And so when I started getting into this homesteading realm, it just made sense for me to try to go about it as environmentally friendly as I could. And I kind of referred to it at the time as holistic homesteading. I didn't know permaculture was a thing. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to return nutrients to my garden beds, I was composting and learning and researching about what else I could add to the garden that would be a natural way to increase nutrients and enhance soil structure. And it was when we got ducks for eggs that I kind of stumbled into this thing where it was like, hey, ducks not only can provide eggs to our household, but they actually can perform a job. You know, here in central New Jersey, we're considered traditionally a wet climate. So we have a lot of snails and a lot of slugs. Um, and ducks, that, that's a very um, large portion of their diet. They actually seek those things out. And so for me to say, okay, I could turn a couple of these 
birds loose in the garden, they can perform a job for me. That was the light bulb moment where I became addicted to the idea that, look, we're not supposed to be in isolation between gardener and the garden. It's supposed to be an ecosystem and it benefits not only our harvest and our yields, it benefits pests and soil structure. Um, so that from there, I learned that that was permaculture. And then I just drank the Kool-Aid and dove in deep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good Kool-Aid, as a matter of fact, right? I like. Uh, we're getting we're getting some great comments throughout this as well. I wanted to let you know. Janelle Sue commented that she's a first generation homesteader. She's really interested in permaculture, and so is appreciating the fact that you're talking about it here and also in the book. <laughs> Uh, because it's something that she's interested in. And obviously we know many others are interested uh, in it as well. And so again, the book is The Sustainable Homestead. For those of you just joining, I'm talking with Angelo Ferrara Fanning, uh, the author of the book. And you can also find her at Axe and Root Homestead, uh, which I love, by the way. So you're you're talking about... Um, Basically, you know, you use the, the example of your ducks and, and that everything serves a purpose. And so one way that I love that you describe how that happens in the book is by laying out your farm in a particular way to, uh, to make it easier to adopt those permaculture principles. And you have these really cool sort of drawings of, um, let's say, sample homesteads in here and and how you would consider or one would consider laying out their farm for all of those principles and I think it's just, it makes it so super user friendly oh good I'm glad I think that's the graphic designer in me that came out <laughs> and was like I need to find a way to visually communicate that you can do a lot with a little. And so that's why there's diagrams in there. I think the smallest is the smallest for a half acre or it might be even smaller mm. than that. I have to flip back to that page now. Let's see here. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. We've got, well, sample maps you have. Yeah, you have a half acre. Half acre, one acre, yeah. and five acre. That would be a dream. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, you can, if you lay things out and if we really start to examine our day-to-day -day routines, and where what areas we frequent the most which is another permaculture approach to laying out any site or homestead or farm it's just that we want to think of things or laying it out in a way where put all the, the places that we spend the most time close together you know we have our home and we have maybe our garage maybe we have a small kitchen garden sort of at the epicenter these are the places where we spend the most time and then it's like okay well, where will we spend the second most amount of time and for me, that's going to be like my horse stables, my animal living spaces that I need to go to multiple times a day, but I don't sleep there. So on the outskirts of the home, you know, I'm going to have my second most visited spaces because that makes sense from a traffic perspective, from an eyesight perspective. And then beyond that, okay, where do I think that I might go frequently, but maybe not visit every day, but maybe every other day, because that's going to be pastures, could be some of my growing spaces. Okay, so put that out further. Can we start to create a visual landscape for, okay, everything doesn't have to be in a row. Everything doesn't have to be, you know, this pasture has to be next to the barn here and blah, blah, blah. It's more about just ease of day-to-day -day function because if we're more inclined to see things and have close proximity and access to things, it's a lot easier for us to function and go weed the garden, go do the harvest. You know, I think it was Bill Mollison, who's a permaculturist, um, one of the founders, he said that in every house he's ever owned, he plants greens and lettuces on his front walkway to his front door because he knows that he is more likely to eat healthy and have a salad if he can see it and harvest it on his way in the house as opposed to coming in and being like, well, I mean, there's cheese and crackers in the fridge. That's a lot easier than going up to the garden to get the lettuce leaves, right? So these are things we can think about that can just make our lives a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. The closer to the back door, the more likely you are to do it. And you and I both know, with chickens at least, you're going out there a couple times a day, and there is little worse than three feet of snow on the ground, and or pouring down rain and having to trudge to the coop yes. to collect eggs and change the water. Yeah. <laughs> or you know, maybe you had thought that your chicken coop would be in a good location, but it turns out it's uphill. So thinking about cold climates, if you're trudging up and down a hill and icy weather that could be a recipe for a fall you know so there's just thinking about things a little bit differently and making sure we spend a lot of time observing and sort of pondering okay what makes the most sense before we just act 
Right, exactly. So um, going back to the food growing, right? You were talking about growing greens by the front walk as that gentleman did. Yeah. Um, so you have a chapter in the book that's dedicated to, to building your soil, which obviously when you have all these animals at your farm, you've got a lot of free resources in terms of fertilizers um, and all of that. And then you have a chapter in here about growing with some advice and tips for um, you know handling pests safely and organically and you know, growing more of your own food. And so all of that information is, is so useful to have um, in the sustainable homestead. And one of my favorite chapters, which I'm gonna turn to here, is incorporating animals. Um, and I love that picture. I love the photography throughout this book. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, yeah, and your homestead is gorgeous. And so this idea of incorporating animals. So maybe now we have that person growing some containers of veggies on their front porch and they're getting started. They now have a little bit of property. They can start to introduce animals. What are some of the things that initially they should think about before bringing some creature home? That's a great question. <laughs> so the first thing we need to think about is what already exists. Because if you have a very high native pollinator population, you might not need to bring in honeybees, if that was something you were originally thinking about doing. Because uh, then we start creating competition. Hmm. If you have a really good um, amount of birds of prey on your property, could be osprey, maybe you have owls. Do you need to bring in 20 barn cats to try to keep rodents away? Because if you do, we're going to create competition. And that's when we start seeing losses and we start experiencing frustration. So. The first thing we need to think about is, okay, what animals or inhabitants are already here? Because if we're trying to approach this from a permaculture perspective, we're not trying to ask those animals to leave. We're not trying to eradicate them. We're trying to work with nature and what's around us rather than against it. And so it's kind of, again, going back to observing and assessing and understanding what's already there. And when you kind of identify this sort of natural ecosystem and this natural population that's already in place, then we can say, okay, what is my goal? Maybe you wanna be a, um, a soap seller. So it makes sense for you to get a source of milk if you wanna do goat's milk soap. And so it's just becomes that, it just comes down to what are you trying to do? And for me, that's trying to grow my own food and have all of the animals contribute to that to increase my yield and improve my soil, which we touched on a moment ago. So the first thing is to do is absolutely assess the, the uh, current population. Second thing is to identify your goals. And then the third thing is to really understand your climate and your terrain. Um, an example would be for me, I have a lot of grassy areas and that is wonderful for sheep. Goats would not necessarily do well on my natural forage that I have here because they prefer something more fibrous and more woody in terms of plant tissue. So by bringing in sheep, I am, um, supplying myself with an animal that's going to be happy to clear the forage that I already have, as opposed to trying to bring in more inputs, you know, added hay, supplemental feed. So, and then it's looking at breeds. You know, when I looked at the sheep, I dove into Romney and uh, Shetland because they do well on pasture. And so because I have all this pasture grass, I'm interested in keeping those sheep healthy and well-fed without having to bring in a lot of additional inputs, as opposed to something like a meat sheep. So, Again, it just goes back to doing the research, and those are definitely the things you can think about. In the book, we break down the different species of animals and different breeds, and what breeds are more suited to certain tasks, such as weeder geese versus a meat goose versus a laying goose, or maybe you want something that's all three. Um, so it's just, again, identifying the goal and the intention. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to show that graphic because I love it so much. This is, uh, this is which breed of goose is right for you. <laughs> Uh, this is the, this is that thought process that you're talking about right now. Like yeah. what, these are all the things that you have to consider when yes. you're making that choice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think, it, it, you know, when we go through talking about these are the things you should consider beforehand, people get really overwhelmed, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. I have to think about all of these things. I have to remember this. I have to look at that. But really all of the answers that you need to create a successful permaculture site are already on the land. It's just a matter of understanding your land and knowing your land to then understanding what's going to be a good fit or a good addition. It really is already all right there. It's just a matter of patience, which is really hard when all you want to do is just get started and you're really excited. Yeah. And I think sometimes 
sometimes a stopping point for people with all this too is they think that they're going to get sheep they're going to need to get you know a dozen sheep or even you know chickens or ducks that they need to get a dozen of them but really i mean it's okay to start small absolutely it is okay to start small you know i have two horses currently and i have five sheep and especially when you're on a small plot no matter if you're rotational grazing or not the more animals you have the more quickly you're going to exhaust your land and so when you're trying to actually use animals to improve land you have to be careful and really start to think about okay maybe starting small is better because it's easier to add i mean yes i guess you could process an animal and what have you but you know the point being that it's just thinking about if we're going to try to have a permaculture approach where we're improving soil and improving land we want to start small so we're not degrading and then trying to replenish later on which is actually the next chapter that i want to talk about which is designing a pasture yeah you know lots of people you know, you're talking about depleting the land and lots of people think a pasture is just a big patch of grass out there and you can do whatever you want on it and you don't have to think about properly caring for it but it's actually quite the opposite and this chapter was really enlightening to me because i've i've never had um animals that required pasture i mean we had chickens and they sort of stayed in their own space protected from predators yeah. but it's it's really quite a science but again not one to be intimidated by right. just one to learn about yeah so i I think a lot of people think pasture and they think of grass and then especially because you know part of the what I do is in the horse area the horse circuit people think Kentucky bluegrass mm. grass can forage however it doesn't really do anything to give back to your soil other than prevent erosion so when I had started getting into permaculture and learning that cover crops can actually feed your animals and improve your soil and your soil structure at the same time that was <laughs> I geeked out on that. I was very excited about that. And um, it turns out that all cover crops are not equal depending on what you're trying to do. So if you are trying to create more organic matter, you know, bring up so, uh, nutrients from the soil sublayers, if you're trying to fix nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium, or invite beneficial insects, there are cover crops that perform all of these different jobs. And better yet, you can combine cover crops and create your own custom recipe that you plant. Cross-reference that with the animals that you keep find something that's appropriate for that digestive system that's not toxic and you're gonna be feeding your animals while you have your soil to me that's a win win and also kind of a no-brainer yeah yeah I, I, and i love that you make it so accessible in the book so we've got as i just showed here this chart of some different cover crops for forage and for livestock uh for forage for livestock species and then you also have sort of like um the, it, the cool, it's listed by sort of the, well, the animal, and then you've got the cover crop possibilities, and then you've got cover crops to avoid, because obviously it's important with certain animals in particular to avoid certain cover yeah. crops. So it's super easy and handy chart to come in. I love this picture, by the way. I know I showed it already, but I'm going to show it again. Thank you. I just, I just love that one. Um, yeah. So, so, and then it's not just, but it's not just about planting it and establishing this pasture you then have to maintain it mm -hmm. so what's involved in that yeah so my way of maintaining my pasture is through rotational grazing i don't go through with a scooper or some homemade device of any kind and clear the fields of manure instead what i do is i start by rotationally grazing my horses they're in there not for a certain number of days because length and duration of forage growth is dependent directly on the season. You know that as a gardener, some seasons, and depending on rain and sunshine, things grow faster at certain times of the year than others. So rather than think about keeping your animals in a certain area for a certain number of days, it's about forage height. So for grasses, you want to put in the horses or your livestock when grasses reach 8 to 10 inches tall, and when legumes are going to reach 10 to 12. So that's things like alfalfa and clover. And what's really great is that when you introduce them, they have all this lush, beautiful forage, and then I pull them. When I pull them, probably, you know, most on average, again, not going back to days, but between two and four days, depending on the time of year. But I like to pull them when the forage has been grazed a couple inches down, because the next group to come in is the sheep. So the horses mm -hmm. are the next pasture, and then the sheep come in. And they eat down that grass even further, but we want to pull them before that pasture grazing or forage height reaches four inches because anything that goes under four inches is going to be overgrazed. And then we slow down our pasture regrowth. We open up our animals even more so to parasites because the larva is going to be at the, the base of the grass blade. And so then the sheep move on. 
but they are not the last group to go through. The last group are the ducks and the geese and the guinea fowl. And they absolutely love to go in there and break apart piles of manures that they see. And they mm. are for insects. They are spreading out that fertilizer. I do not have to drag out my pastures. And after that group goes through the pasture rest, it regrows and it rehabilitates itself. So because I have divided up my pasture spaces into about eight to 10 areas, depending on the season, I'll use my backyard if I need it. Um, the animals, it can be three to four weeks before they get back to pasture number one where they started. And so that really helps with regrowth and regeneration. It keeps the animals healthy because they are eating ideal forage. Um, it helps sequester carbon in the soil through the process of photosynthesis, just pasture regrowing back. And it's not growing at a slower rate because it hasn't been overgrazed. And we're also ingesting parasites between the species as they go, thus keeping my animals healthier. So it sounds like a lot, but really it's just moving the groups, making sure nothing is overgrazed and everything gets a chance to rest. And it's so interesting as you're talking about this, and I'm listening to this because when I mentioned before us, oh, you know, it sounds like a lot of work, but it really isn't. And th that's actually the point that you just made, right. right? If you do it right, you're actually making less work for yourself in the end because you're not having to go scoop up the manure piles. You're not having to reseed the area all the time because it's been over foraged. It's just, it's sustaining itself. It's, it's, it's sustainable. Imagine yeah. that, the sustainable homestead, right? <laughs> it is. It's self sustaining And I think that that is, um, the, the majority of the work and sort of the downfall, I think that permaculture gets, hi Orsa, it's one of my guard dogs. <laughs> one of the downfalls of permaculture is that it's not complete and total instant gratification, right? What we have is we have some brain power and some research up front to make sure the system is gonna work first. And a lot of people are intimidated and they say, I don't know where to start. Um, it's taking me forever to figure this out. That's actually a good thing. It means you're putting the research and the thought into it so that it can be almost automatic and sustain itself later on. So doing the research, having it take a while, that means you're putting the right amount of thought into it. That's a good thing. Yeah. That's not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah a very good thing. So yeah. we do have a question that cropped up here from um, <laughs> Moment in Space blog, and they asked how, long, how, or how large should a pasture be? And how do you determine that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So it depends on the livestock that you have, the species of livestock, you know, a bigger breed of sheep, for example, is going to need more forage per day than, um, than a smaller breed of sheep. So what we need to look at is something called, um, uh, there's stock density calculators out there. And you plug in the type of forage that you have growing in your plot. You plug in the number of animals that you have and the type of animals you have, the age and the health of those animals. And it can help you figure out how many animals are appropriate per pasture space. And it can also help you figure out, okay, if I wanna divide that even further to make sure that it's all equally grazed, right? Because if we give them a lot of area, they're gonna designate favorable spots and they're gonna designate bathroom spots. If we shrink it down, it's gonna make sure that it's all evenly grazed. Then you can kind of say, okay, this is a pasture size that works for me. It's okay to experiment. I always recommend starting with a half acre plot. And in that, I put my two horses, they move on, and then I put my five sheep and they move on. So you can experiment with a quarter acre. You can do it with a half. Um, give them enough space that they're not gonna exhaust the forage in one day. Gotcha. And you actually do have, a. am looking for it right now, a, uh, an infographic or a graphic here in the book that shows you sort of just that, and I'm not gonna be able to find it because I'm under pressure to find <laughs> it. Um, but it's, oh, here we go. Yeah, it's how you would take and divide a space, some different ways that you could divide it into sections yeah. and, and how you might rotate the animals through it, which is also really clever because a lot of us think you have to have like four quadrants no. and rotate, but, but yeah. you can actually do it in some really different ways. Yeah, if you only have one water trough, you know, the thing that we're worried about is everybody gets hydrated while they're foraging. So put the water trough in the middle and sequester the different areas from there. Or maybe you go ahead and you do have four or two or three water traps for however many sections that you decide you need. And so you give everybody their own water trap and divide it that way. Or maybe you think, okay, I only have one gate and I wanna make sure if I need to, I can pull the species in and out very quickly as needed. All right, so let's make the epicenter the gate. So really it comes back to just ease of use. And that's a, that's a common thread. It's a common theme that we see throughout everything that we do in permaculture is we want things to be easy. Because if they get difficult, we run into problems. We don't want to do it. Then things get neglected. So it's just better if we just design it in a way that's going to be more functional for everyone. 
Yeah. Well, who knew that I could talk about pastures forever because it, just, it actually, it really fascinates me. Um, and, and I just want folks to know that in your book, The Sustainable Homestead, there's so much more information than we could ever access here in this little half hour chat. Um, it's, it's so comprehensive. I mean, there's great guides in there to making compost really efficiently. Uh, orchardry, which I think is so fascinating. You've got some really um, actionable, usable charts in there about, you know, how do you choose the right uh, tree fruits for your climate based on how cold it gets in the winter. And it's just, um, it's just all encompassing. And it really, I think, uh, will get lots of people enthused to start this process, or if they're already in the middle of, you know, establishing a homestead, or maybe they've been a homesteader for a long time, they're still going to get a lot of great information from this book. So thank you so much for joining me, Angela. So aside from finding you at Axe and Root Homestead, where can folks learn more about you and your book? Sure. So uh, Axe and Root Homestead is my username across the board. You can find me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. It's also my web address, axeandroothomestead.com. Um, the book is available on Amazon and wherever else books are sold. So Barnes and Noble. And then I also have another series called The Little Homesteader, which is geared towards families and, uh, you know, kids, adults getting into that homesteading mindset, like we talked about, regardless of whether or not you live on a farm or in a high rise building. And it's, again, just getting into the mindset of living by the seasons and connecting with nature. Excellent. Well, thank Thank you so much, Angela, for joining me. Really appreciate it. And I hope y'all come back the next time for our next Cool Springs Press author chat. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.